got the opportunity um, with Bernadine's community. She's not here this morning. Um, she's at a wedding, actually. Uh, but we have the opportunity to minister to uh, the community that Bernadine lives in. And uh, we are providing a play set for them along with uh, they're doing a cookout this Saturday. And so we're going to be uh, donating some of the food that we had from a family fun day towards that and uh, hopefully being able to establish a connection there. Uh, Bernadine's had some great conversations with the uh, park director there, and, or manager. She was very quick to correct me on that. It's a manager, not a director. <laughs> but uh, so we're, we're looking forward to how uh, God will use that of meeting physical needs in order to have the opportunity to share with them the truth about their spiritual needs, which is what we just looked at. Uh, with Jesus and the woman at the well in Sunday school. I encourage you, if you're not uh, able to come out to that, uh, I still have printouts of the notes. So if, if you're uh, interested in that, we're looking at the Christ Center Church and we're talking about how that affects our preaching, how it affects our worship, how it affects our community of believers as a body, how it affects our outreach into the community, the ministries that we prioritize, those sorts of things, all those are important. Every single aspect of what we do is vitally important, that it is rooted in Scripture, that it's found there, and therefore we have justification for doing it uh, in our own church, not simply because it's what the church down the street does. We're looking this morning at uh, this sermon that I've entitled, God Fights for Israel, and uh, you probably know this chapter. It's probably one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. Uh, David fighting Goliath. It's probably easily, I would think, in the top ten uh, most preached passages of Scripture. I've heard it multiple times in my lifetime, as I am sure you've heard it at least once or twice. Uh, I've heard terrible sermons and memorable sermons from this. Uh, so as, as we look at chapter 17... I just want to remind us kind of the, the framework, the glasses, so to speak, that we've been wearing this whole time. Uh, as we've looked at 1 Samuel the, this year, we've wanted to see what God is doing in the passage, not simply focusing on the characters. We're, we want to see what God is doing in this passage. We, we look at that through both a small, medium, and large uh, lens, uh, we want to see how it connects to the character shifts that we are witnessing. We, we want to see that going on. We also want to see how it impacts Israel's history. And where does it fall within uh, the timeline of Israel's history? And then how does that fit into our understanding of Christ, the gospel, and God's redemptive plan for humanity? Those are kind of uh, the three uh, lenses, so to speak, those three tiers that we've been seeking to do. And so as we saw, David is anointed king last chapter in chapter 16. Then he's just playing music at the end of that chapter. <laughs> and uh, you can kind of wonder, okay, God's using him, but why did he have to be anointed king in order to play music for Saul? Is that really necessary to be there? And then the, the further question from that leads to how do we go from a shepherd being anointed king to him actually leading God's people? He's leading sheep now. How is he going to lead Israel? And chapter 17 steps in and answers that question. It answers that question by showing us a really terrified Israelite army that's following Saul at the beginning. And we're going to see by the end of chapter 17, Israel's now following David. And God blesses David's obedience and faith to accomplish victory for Israel, and he shifts the heart of the people from Saul to David. So let's dive into this familiar chapter. Chapter 17 in 1 Samuel begins, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and they're gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Ezekah in Ephraim's Demim. And Saul and the people of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah. 
and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood in the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. A champion came out from the camp of Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was about six or 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to, uh, to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and your servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Father, we have already asked for your help, and we ask it again. We are seeking to understand your word. We seek to apply it to our lives. We seek to be part of the body of Christ in this community that both understands and, under, and receives your word and then applies it in our lives. And so as we worship this morning, as we have sister churches in the area that are worshiping this morning, we pray that you would meet us and that you would enlighten our eyes to the truths of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, we find Israel's army is terrified. And that really summarizes the first 11 uh, verses that are going on here. The beginning is a very normal way for the armies to gather together to fight. Uh, this idea of battle lines carries from that time all the way up to British times, fighting against the colonial armies of the United States. And so this idea that we both line up and then we're going to fight that is a traditional way of meeting for battle. And in the ancient world, then two warriors would then come forward, and they would battle it out. And whoever won claimed victory for his people. The rest of the army didn't actually do anything. Just that one warrior. He lived or died, and that was the end of the battle. The Philistines select their giant, who's intimidating and fearsome. And Israel has Saul. For a king. Remember what they wanted? They wanted a king who will fight our battles for us. So they chose the biggest, the tallest, the handsomest. And what is he doing? He is afraid with all of Israel in verse 11. All of them heard it. They're dismayed and they're greatly afraid. They're terrified. So Saul is this king who's been chosen by the people to fight their battles. But Saul's height and his good looks don't win him the, the fight. And so instead, Israel is shaking in their tents, and it really seems hopeless. That is everything up to verse 11. If, if you have other translations, you probably already know the weights there. I looked them up and forgot to write them down. So, um, but you can look that up easily to, to see De, uh, Goliath somewhere, somewhere between 9 and 10 feet, roughly, and uh, he's roughly wearing around 150 pounds of armor on him. That's, that's roughly what the brass is. So just think of just a grown man hanging on top of you. Uh, that's, that, he's literally just lumbering into battle with a grown man hanging on him uh, right there. And, and so the, he's very intimidating. He's got a shield bearer out there with him as well. And he's yelling, thundering out for somebody to challenge him. He's eager to battle, and Israel is terrified to battle. That, that is his opening scene. So that is Israel as, as a terrified army, and then you move forward to this champion that's introduced. We already know David from chapter 16, but he once again comes into the scene here in verse 12. David was the son of the Ephrathite in Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. So presumably this is later, after he has been anointed. 
The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him was Abinadab, and the third was Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. Uh, there's interesting uh, wording there. Just remember that. They are always following Saul. That's repeated multiple times here at the beginning. They're following Saul. But David, in verse 15, occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David's bouncing back and forth. He's doing errands. He's bringing rations. And he's still caring for his father's sheep in Bethlehem. Verse 16, the Philistines drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and evening. We've already addressed this phrase earlier in the series as we talked about 40 days as a idiom in Hebrew, but this has been going on for a while. And so Jesse tells his son David in verse 17, take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at camp. Carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. So David and they and all the men of Israel, or sorry, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Fighting hasn't actually happened. They're just standing there yelling at each other. So David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went to Jesse as he commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, the quartermaster, and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then he talked with them, and there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming out from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words that he's been saying this whole time. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel went, and they saw the man, and fled from him. And they were dreadfully afraid. Nothing's changed. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who came up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be the man who kills him. The king will enrich with great riches. He will give him his daughter and will give his father's house tax exemption. <laughs> That's the real key here. You get tax exemption for the rest of your life. How about that? He's going to be rich. He's going to get the fathers, uh, or he's going to get the princess and tax exemption for life. What more could a man want? Verse 26 And David spoke to the men who stood by him and said, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now, as we're going to stop there before we get into uh, Eliab and, and Saul's reaction to David's comments there. But this is David's introduction, verses 12 to, to 27. He's come into the scene. He's obeying his father. He's bouncing back and forth between battle. And, and he's bringing in rations. We see in verse 20, he's still responsible that, that he's leaving the sheep with a keeper. He's, he's obeying his father. And Israel's come out in this battle formation, but they're retreating terrified still of Goliath. And Saul's looking for a courageous man to save them. He was what the people wanted to be the courageous man, but he's looking for a courageous man to save them. And he's looking for someone other than God. If you've tracked the progression of Saul's battles, remember, the first battle that Saul does, he's coming in from the field. He kills the oxen he was just plowing, prays for God to help them, and he goes out to fight. The second time that he does that, Jonathan is the one who leads. And Saul is trying to figure out whether or not he should use the ephah to figure out God's will. And then lastly, we just saw Saul's disqualified because instead of following the Lord's explicit instructions to kill Agag, he's done what he wanted. And now 
He is not even looking to God to help them in battle. That is the progression of Saul's, of Saul's de- demise here. The, the reward of riches and a princess and tax-free living, none of that's pointing Israel to their king. None of that's pointing them to their God and saying, God will save us. This is not Moses saying, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This is Saul cowering in a tent saying, please, somebody be brave enough to go out and lose their life to this giant. So we come to David's first recorded words. David hasn't said anything in chapter 16, and he hasn't said anything yet here. And so in verse 26, David's first recorded words is, Who is this man who's defied the living God? Who is this person who is coming out? He doesn't know who our God is. He's uncircumcised. He's a wicked heathen. And he thinks he can defeat our God? That is David's contrast immediately. I mean, it's so stark to see Saul and David contrasted here. And then what is the response in verse 28? Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to them, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with, with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? If you are the oldest brother, you know exactly how he's saying this. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. He's not just incensed at his brother's eagerness towards the battle. He's irritated. He's despising him. And David's response, whatever translation you have, is his response here, what have I done now? <laughs> As if this is an ongoing fight between him and Eliab. Eliab hates me. What have I done now? I'm the youngest of eight boys here. What have I done now that's annoying you, Eliab? Is there not a cause here? Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first one did. None of them are taking David seriously. David's the only one who seems to actually take offense to what Goliath's saying. Eliab is the first one that Samuel thought would be the next king. Why? Because he looks just like Saul. And he's despising his baby brother for coming out and trying to act all tough. But remember, David is the unlikely choice. Samuel didn't even think he was going to be the next king. He's the unlikely choice, but he's God's choice. Notice, he says, uh, Eliab says that he knows his heart. I know your heart, David. It's evil. It's arrogant. What did God tell Samuel in the previous chapter? No, man looks on the outward appearance. I'm the one who looks on the heart. God is the one who sees his heart. Eliab is saying, you don't have pure motives. You're just trying to make a name for yourself. You're not the anointed king. You're just trying to take over the kingdom. We talked about those accusations arising from the last chapter, and now it's starting to come out from his own family. His own brother doesn't think that he should do this. So verse 31 to 33, we see David shifts quickly over to Saul. Uh, everyone else is saying the same thing that Eliab says, verse 20, or 32. rather. David says to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're a youth. He's a man of war from his youth. Uh, Notice what Saul immediately appeals to. Uh, Eliab says, You don't have good motives. Saul says, You don't have the ability. Goliath's way older than you. He's been doing it longer. You don't know what you're doing out there. You don't have the ability. And and David gives a personal resume here in verse 34. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after and I struck it. I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. When, once again, David, 
He specifically points to what the Lord has done. And he's saying, because he is defying the armies of the Lord, it's not my ability. It's God who's going to fight this battle. The Lord rescued me in the past, and he will rescue me now. And here Saul and David are contrasted again. Saul is offering riches. He's offering weapons. We see then he, he wants to give David his, his armor in verse 38. He, he, Saul says, go and the Lord be with you. In verse 38, Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And he said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Uh, Saul's offering all the physical things, and David says the Lord doesn't need those. Verse 40, he took his staff in his hand, he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in his shepherd's bag and in the pouch which he had, and his sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The, the contrast here is that while, while Saul is still looking at this from his perspective, he's worried about looking the part and being savvy and having everyone's approval. That's been his downfall the whole time. And, and then we have him as the people's choice, and Samuel confronts him in his sin. And what is his primary concern? Looking good to the people. And now he faces a threat to the kingdom, and he's terrified along with all the people. That has been what's defined Saul. He's always appealing to the people. And David says, I don't need your weapons. I'm just going out in faith. I don't need to know how to fight Goliath because this is God's battle. He's going to fight it. And I just need to trust in him. And so this contrast of Israel pervasively doing what is right in their own eyes, Saul being the typical person of that, and David then beginning to lead the people back to faith in God. Samuel's done that in his time, but he's now old, and David will pick up this task of bringing the people back to faith and trust in God. He is the one who fights our battles. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. He is our true king. It's always been God's battle. Uh, notice, God is the one who brings them out of Egypt to the promised land. God is the one who, through his power, gives victory to a bunch of former slaves against trained armies. It's his glory that Israel is supposed to be representing to the other nations around them. And Goliath comes out to represent the Philistines as the uncircumcised, those who don't believe in Yahweh, those who are trusting in their own strength. And Saul is no better. He's trusting in his own strength. And David says, no, we need to trust in God. Verse 41, the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. The man who bore his shield went before him. And then the Philistine looked about and saw David, and he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give, this car give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Because up to this point, we weren't sure. Everyone's been terrified of you. So right now, I am going to come out and represent this God and show the world that there is a God here. Notice again, Goliath points out David's size. He calls him puny. 
He's, he's a toy to be played with by the dog. David comes out to represent God. You've defied not the armies of the Lord. You've defied the Lord. That is whom you have defied today. The Lord will win this fight, he says in verse 45. So David has this expectation that God will win and vindicate his name before the fight ever starts. That is the confidence. It's not David saying, I've mastered the sling. It's not David saying, well, I've killed a bear that was close to your size, so how hard can it be? It's David saying, it's the God of Israel that can kill you. And I am simply stepping out in faith knowing he will defend his name. No one else has this expectation. And that is another stark contrast of what's going on. Verse 48, So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Then the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And, wound, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road of uh, Sharam, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Then David, or then Saul saw David going out against the Phil, when, sorry, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, "Abner, whose son is this youth?" And Abner said, "As, my, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know." So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. We see finally here that victory is secured. The army is terrified in the beginning. The champions introduced even though he's mocked, he's discredited, he's ridiculed, and now the victory is secured. David hurls the stone, God pushes Goliath down, and David chops his head off. Israel rallies and defeats the Philistines again. We've seen this play out now three times in the book. As we look at that medium view, the Philistines gathered Israel repented, Samuel prayed for deliverance, right? That's where they raised Ebenezer. The Philistines were defeated before Israel ever got to them. Saul then was gathered against the Philistines. We just saw this a few chapters ago. Jonathan by faith sneaks over, and God uses two men to start a huge victory that Saul had nothing to do with. In chapter 14, you, see, you saw Jonathan say this to his armor bearer, It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. And that is what ties together the friendship of Jonathan and David. They both have the same attitude about the Lord. They both recognize that God can do the impossible. And their resolute faith in that has led Jonathan to victory, and now it's led David to victory. And so Saul is gathered again here. Nobody wants to fight the giant, and David steps out in faith, and God defeats the Philistines again. You would think that Israel kind of would pick up on this at some point, but they're not picking up the clues. We see David later write this in, in Psalm 20, verses 6 through 9. What does he say? Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. 
He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. David knows this from experience, even here as a young man. And so as we think about how does this relate then to our understanding of Christ and the gospel and God's redemptive plan, I've already given you the connection from the very beginning. It's seen in how do the armies fight. Each chooses a champion who secures victory. The rest of the army doesn't have to fight. Their people win or lose completely based on that duel. And our champion is Christ. Our champion, just like Israel, we're terrified, we're hopeless, we're helpless. Jonathan just talked about that in the psalm we looked at this morning. That we are helpless against our enemy of, this, of sin. In Genesis 3, the Father promises that this champion is going to crush the head of Satan, who is the giant of sin. Christ, our champion, sacrifices himself for the world, and those who trust in him for salvation share in that victory. The Israelites are still in their tents terrified when David secures victory, right? Right? We are still the enemies of Christ when he dies on the cross for us. We have great enemies in our lives that we're all terrified of. Uh, We we have fears. Uh, We're all afraid to die. You might not want to admit that. But deep down inside, every one of us is afraid to die. Because it's unknown. It's uncharted waters. Uh, When when you talk to somebody who's had cancer, that can help you know what to expect. When you've talked to somebody who's lost their parents, that can help you as you lose your own. When you talk to somebody who's lost a child, who's lost a spouse, that can help you. You can't talk to somebody who's died. They can't help you face that. But Christ can. Because he has faced death. And he has risen, victorious. And so when we're afraid about the end of our lives, we're we're afraid to get to the end of our lives, we're full of regret, afraid that our lives won't measure up, we're paralyzed by a sinful heart that's leading to our own destruction, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they agree together to come and win this battle for us. Like David left his sheep, Jesus leaves heaven, and he enters the battlefield of earth. He is the opposite of what the Jews were looking for in a Messiah. The religious leaders despise him, just like David was despised. They they call him a blasphemer for claiming to be God. They mock his age for claiming to know Abraham and David. Jesus refuses to enter Jerusalem as a conquering king. Rather, he comes in on a humble donkey. Jesus bravely endures torture and death through taunting that you're not strong enough. I thought you had power to deliver yourself. You saved others, but you can't save yourself. He was not the strong, battle-hardened warrior who throws off the Roman oppression. He is the gentle, caring shepherd who cares for the sick and the outcasts. He rebukes the religious leaders and teaches the people to return to trust and faith in Yahweh. That is what Christ does. He goes to the cross alone. He dies in our place. Then he rises victorious over our enemies of sin, death, and the grave. He's victorious in the fight. And so in every way, Jesus is the true and better David. David's going to fall. He's going to fail. He's going to become a horrible savior for Israel. A horrible example of a husband and a father. Christ is our champion who sacrifices himself and secures victory for those who put their faith in him. So as we think about this, what are some of the takeaways? Well, first, 
Since Christ has conquered our enemies and secured victory for us, have you put your faith in Him as your only hope of victory? Have you put your faith in Him for your only hope beyond the grave to conquer sin, to have hope after death? As we think about our fears and our worries, they have no power before a risen champion. They are powerless because Christ has defeated them. Are we living in that victory? Do you live in the victory that Christ has secured for you if you're believing in Him? We saw Saul who looks for the solution to his life problems everywhere but calling out to God. He's looking at anything but Christ. And Christ calls us to trust in Him. We need to turn from what is right in our own eyes and we need to stop looking for our own solutions to our life and instead seek God's direction, His power, and trust in His victory. And as a result, as we see David here, he entered as a boy who cares for his father's sheep and he leaves as his father's son. He's not defined by his achievements. He's not defined, like this is not his make or break moment that I finally had that breakthrough and now I can take over the kingdom. No, David was a shepherd at the beginning and he's still the one who watches the sheep at the end. It's easy for us to get caught up in making a name for ourselves. We compare ourselves to our family or our co-workers or our neighbors to make us feel better about who we are. But Christ has won that for me. He gives me my identity. He gives me my acceptance. My approval is found in Him. He has secured my salvation for me. So how I compare to others doesn't matter anymore. So he doesn't walk up and say, well, apparently I had more faith than you did, Saul. Uh, we won. <laughs> You're welcome. No, no, I'm a sinner who needed saved by grace just like everyone else around me. So do you and I live in the good of that victorious Savior? Do we recognize, no, we're not better because our champion is who defines us, not me. It's not my good works of righteousness that I've done, but by his mercy and grace that he saved me. Does Christ hold our affections, and our identity? Or are we chasing that through some action that we could do here on earth? Father, we are grateful that you have secured victory for us, that you are the God who fights for us. That you, while we were yet sinners and your enemies who hated you, who were terrified and helpless in sin, you stepped out of heaven condescended to our low estate and took on yourself the punishment of our sins as our sacrifice and you are our victor. You are our victorious champion who rose again conquering the chains and the giants that we were enslaved under and offering us salvation through faith in you. I pray that this good news would shape us, that we would no longer be terrified like the Israelites, but we would rally behind our champion and that we would rejoice in the victory that you've won for us. And that as a result, our lives would be transformed, that we would not be cowardly in our tents, wondering when you're going to return victorious, but rather we would step boldly forward as victorious saints who has a Christ who's already won. And so we don't need to fear the battle because it's already been decided. We simply need to step forward in faith